You got it this time. It's gonna be perfect. A brief tour of, of the museum here, and if you would, uh, you know, do come to the house for one of during our tour hours, uh, you get a full view of the museum. I'm going to take you through the first floor today. Um, uh, the house does have three floors all together. The floor, uh, the original cellar with the original cooking kitchen down there, and the second story, which would contain all the bedrooms in the home here. Uh, I'll give you a little brief history of the Fairport County Heritage Association. The Heritage Association started in 1962 a group of women um, here in town that were concerned over the lost old homes and buildings here in the Lancaster area. So that was their mission, was to try to save these buildings, you know, either out, have them restored or reused so we aren't losing them. Um, in 1968, it did merge with the existing Fairfield County Historical Society, and uh, so now we, we are officially the Historical Society of Fort Fairfield County. Um, a little history on the home here. The home was built from 1830 to 1832. Um, it is federal architecture. It's a uh, brick home, uh, brick exterior and interior walls. All the woodwork, doors, and panels you see in the home are original. They're never removed from the home, so we're fortunate we still have um, all the original architecture left in the home here. Uh, the original uh, builder, his name was Daniel Sifford. He built a lot of, a lot of the large early homes here in the 18, early 1800s period. This home, uh, the Decorative Arts Center, he built it also. And a lot of the large early churches here in downtown, he built also. The original owners of the home were Samuel and Sarah McCracken. He was a wealthy businessman here in Lancaster, came to Lancaster about 1815. Um, they built this home, uh, interesting enough, as a retirement home. Um, as you can come through this experience, it's a very large home, 13 rooms all together. So it kind of uh, plays against our current mindset when you retire, you downsize. It's like they almost upsize here. Uh, they lived here about 20 years. He was uh, 45 when they built it. Um, 20 years, and, um, and he did, they did at that time sell the home and did move, move to a smaller home up the hill here on Willing Street, to what we would consider a downsize at that time. After the McCrackens had it, he went to the Martin family. Family here was he was a lawyer here in town. In the 1880s period, when Brooks McCracken, he's a grandson of the original owner, he he bought the home, kind of brought it back into the family. At that time, they did up an addition on the rear of the house, which uh, brought the kitchen up from downstairs, basically to the first floor, and there were some base quarters on the second story of that addition. Um, after the grandson owned the home, it went to the Reeves family. He was, uh, Mr. Reeves was the judge here in town. Um, uh, they uh, had it uh, through the turn of the century, early 1900s. Um, after Mr. and Mrs. Reeves passed away, their son lived here. Um, in the 1920s, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the money kind of ran out. The house was sold to share sale due to back taxes on it. After that period, some small businesses operated out of the home. One of those was a tea room, and the tea room was named Georgia. A lot of people here in town still remember that name, so the house kept that name after it was restored here. But in the late 60s, early 70s, the house got into a state of total disrepair. It actually was condemned by the city of Lancaster. There was pending uh, demolition. But the uh, Heritage Society, Heritage Association, did step in, uh, where was able to purchase it from the owner, and they began the restoration in 1972, opened that museum in 1976. So we'll kind of walk through um, the uh, first floor here. I'll point out the front doorway here. You notice how wide it is, much wider than a normal door today. Uh, the these large early homes, uh, often when they could afford it, they put these large doors in. They're called coffin doors. Uh, one theory was that they would uh, didn't have funeral homes in the 1800s, but they had viewings in the home. So it said these doors were wide enough they could bring a coffin through very easily into the homes. Um, here, the original lock, interesting story on this. This was um, not here when they were restoring the home. The original lock was gone. But this house came, or this lock came off of an early, early home here in Lancaster. And when they uh, were restoring the home, they put this lock in place. The bolt holes lined up exactly where the original lock was at. So it's probably the same model and everything, same time period. That's what this home was built. Uh, this piece of furniture here in the corner, it's an umbrella or cane stand. Uh, this is the original piece of furniture used here in the home by the McCrackens. Uh, Mr. McCracken um, and some of his business dealings, um, one position he had uh, with the state of Ohio was he was uh, ran the board of trustees for Ohio Canals. And he would actually go to England and Europe to find investors to invest in the canals here in Ohio. And he would take business trips there. Uh, he purchased uh, several pieces of furniture. This is one we know of. It was made in England, shipped over here, used in the home. 
weather item here in the front parlor, or sorry, for hallway, uh, is this uh, pure mirror or pure table here. If you notice, uh, there's a mirror underneath there between the legs. Um, it was said a uh, lady of the home glanced down in there to make sure her petticoats weren't showing underneath her dress before she left the home. As we move on back to the uh, front hallway here, um, I'll point out this tall case clock we have here. And today we kind of call them grandfather clocks, but they were called tall case clocks. You notice it has a blue ribbon on it. Um, furniture in the home that uh, was originally made furniture from reality as part of the heritage collection will have a blue ribbon on it. So this clock was made here in Lancaster um, by a clock maker last name is Thurman. It's about 1830. Um, it was uh, made for one family here in town, the Work family. Uh, they had it um, well over 150 years, and I believe it's the late uh, 1980s. Uh, one of the descendants uh, left it to the heritage. Uh, he passed away and has been in place here for Georgia since then. Another piece of furniture here in the front hallway. Uh, this is a uh, hall front desk. A little bit later piece of furniture, dates about 1870. Gets its name from the hall front here, how it opens. Uh, it's unusual on all this inlaid uh, ivory marquetry um, done on it. It makes these medieval hunting scenes. And it was originally uh, made in Italy and imported to America. Now we'll move into the front parlors. Um, so the home has uh, two front parlors here. Uh, they're, uh, they're often referred to as um, um, twin parlors because they're identical. If you look back and forth between the two, they're identical in the layout, uh, the way that they're done and everything. Um, kind of the more unusual features of the room um, are these shallow cupboards uh, that you see um, in the wall space here. Um, you know, they look like they were a, a doorway at one time. Um, they're maybe just like the doors of the home, but they're just shallow covers. Um, so the only function of them was the house being federal architecture because the rooms are very, very well balanced. Because there was a doorway on the left-hand side of this wall, they put these shallow covers in to look like a doorway just to make that wall look symmetrical here. Some other items in the front of this uh, south parlor. Um, the mantles you see, both of these mantles in the parlor, they're, they're identical. Um, they're called, it's made from King of Prussia blue marble, which um, came from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which was here in the birthplace of Mr. McCrack and the original owner. It's believed they were carved at the quarry there to carry the covered wagon and installed in the house when they were building it here. So all, they're um, all original, very good shape, and very unusual. And it's interesting to note that quarry is now covered by the Pennsylvania Turnpike. So there's no more of this particular marble being produced uh, from, from the Pennsylvania there. Um, the mantle over the, um, sorry, the portrait over the mantle here is Dr. Michael Effinger. He was an early doctor here in Lancaster. His home sat across the street from the Georgian. So he was a contemporary with the McCrackens, and I'm yeah, sure that they knew each other since they were neighbors. Uh, on the mantle there is another piece of original furnishings here in the home. It's a uh, empire, French empire clock that my crack had purchased in um, England when he was there and uh, had it shipped over and they used it here at the home. I will also point out here in the front parlor, we, we kind of scan over to these front windows here. Um, if you notice, there's small doors at the bottom of the windows. Um, and these doors, uh, they're called tip doors or jib doors, like a jib on a boat. And how they worked, on the exterior of the home, there's a two-story portico um, that faces Broad Street. Um, but they can take the bottom side of the window, put it up all the way, and the small doors open to the interior, and they can walk in and out of the portico there. So you imagine uh, it probably did give them a lot of ventilation in the summer uh, here in the home building it up that way. Uh, but that's a very unusual feature um, in a home of this period. I will also point out um, a chest of drawers um, back here in the uh, parlor. Uh, this is a uh, Fairfield County piece. It's a called a tall chest of drawers. It's a uh, tire maple and cherry inlay used in it. Uh, it's made at Folks Corner, which uh, is up at uh, State Route 37 and Pleasantville Road up towards the uh, Pleasantville Baltimore area. That was the site of the early cabinet maker there. He made a lot, a lot of uh, furniture here in the 1830s, 40s period. Um, this is one that's very unusual for its style and size. Um, and we're fortunate to have that here at the museum. All right, uh, we'll kind of pass into the north parlor here in the home. As you kind of see, it's laid out you know, identical to the other parlor that we were just in. 
Uh, I will point out the interior doors here in the parlor. Um, the uh, wood in the panels you see, a little bit darker wood, is called San, San Domingo Mahalpi. It was an imported wood and it was quite expensive in those days. So um, again, it's kind of like McCracken built this large early home, cut this uh, fancy wood, is able to port this wood to put it in this home here. Uh, you know, it was a status symbol, um, the, the wealth he had accumulated uh, to that point in his life here. Um, as we move into this parlor, uh, we're fortunate a lot of this furniture in this room uh, was donated by descendants of the McCrackens, the original owners, over the years. So uh, that furniture included the sofa, the secretary along the wall, uh, the items in the wall covered there are just used here by the McCrackens. It also includes uh, the painting, uh, the two paintings in here, the painting over the mantel is the original owner of the home, Samuel McCracken. And then there's a second painting between these windows of his wife, Sarah McCracken. Um, her painting, they believe, was done here in the home. If you can see it, there's a column in the background behind her in the painting. And the sofa she's sitting on, they believe it's this sofa right here, because the arm is identical, um, pretty much in the painting as to what we have, have yeah, this sofa that's been donated to the home. Um, a couple other interesting items in this room. Um, in this interior wall covered here, the uh, set of silver you see there to tea set. That was a wedding gift from Mr. McCracken to Mrs. McCracken, um, dating the 1800s. We originated in Philadelphia, but it was used, it used here in the home by the McCrackens also. Um, I'll also point out uh, this fire pole screen. It's a little uh, interesting uh, piece of furniture. The McCrackens did own this also. Uh, the function of a fire pole screen, one theory is, uh, they suffered from a lot of disease in the 1800s, one of them being smallpox. Smallpox would leave scars in their face. So they used to make that that had a heavy wax content in it uh, to fill in the scars and make their faces look smoother. But if they were um, in the winter near a fire to keep warm, uh, they, they could use the screen um, on the pole to move it up and down to shield their face directly from the heat of the fire to prevent the makeup from running that they wore those days. So I don't think it was quite, quite lovely in those days, but uh, it's quite interesting about the, how they lived in those days. Um, I think next we'll go out to the um, rear part of the front hallway and we'll take a look at the uh, spiral stairway in the hall. All right, uh, so this uh, spiral stairway you see, I'm fortunate it is probably 99% original. When the Heritage Society purchased the home, a few of these spindles that you see were missing from the uh, from the um, staircase. They found a few in the cellar, it said some in the attic, found a few in the yard. I guess it meant you just an idea what state the sheep was in. I believe from the record they found all but two of them, and they had two reproduced and installed um, here. But it's up cherry and it's all original there. Um, here uh, we'll mention um, this that's no post here. There's a silver button here. Uh, which is kind of unusual. You think, why would they have a silver button there? Um, one theory, uh, which has not been substantiated, was in this period of the 1830s, if your home was paid for when it was built, so you didn't have, they only have mortgages in those days like we do today, they would have loans, like a balloon payment loan sitting out there if they needed to finance their home. But it was said, um, if you pay cash for your home, you had no loan, the builder would put these silver buttons on no post. If you had a if you had a loan, there'd be an iron or enforcement button there. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a status symbol thing here. And if you go to homes experience, sometimes you won't see porcelain or iron buttons or silver there. Um, and probably that designation. Um, if you want to kind of move forward here, uh, we can look up the stairway here. It's quite a spectacular view. Uh, the stairway does go up for three stories. The third story to talk is just an attic space. It was uh, never finished off lived in or anything where it's not like a ballroom, it's not that big, but it is great storage for the home. The, uh, the uh, skylight you see at the top is also an original. In those days they called it a sky lantern. Um, and it's called a freestanding staircase because there isn't really any internal support holding the uh, holding the stairs up. It's just cantilevered out from the wall um, when it's built out. And that's how you get these uh, very uh, dramatic circular motion that you see on the stairway. I will mention uh, this doorway here behind me. This is the end of the original home. There was a small porch out there, they called it a carriage stoop. 
where they came in off of the U-shaped driveway, off of the wagons and carriages, came into the home this way. Um, back there now is uh, the addition that's built in the 1880s of the kitchen, and the heritage office is currently in the second story of that addition back there. Okay, uh, we'll move into the original dining room of the home here, which is quite bright with yellow, it's uh, kind of same with peach colored wallpaper here, but uh, they often we think you know, they didn't have a lot of paint or things were dry, but uh, I think the research they actually did use uh, bright colors, as you see here, uh, and wallpaper. Interesting, um, the wallpaper was very expensive in the 1800s, uh, so they couldn't afford so that's a lot of it. But they would use it in borders, as you see it as it was done in this room during the restoration. Um, most of the furniture in this room is all original to Fairfield County. The uh, large sideboard here uh, was donated to the Heritage actually before they had this um, museum. And uh, originally, the old finish had turned dark on it, and they had it refinished, and it turned out to be apple root. This is burl wood, you see, and then cherry and copper used in it. So the, uh, the burl wood is quite, the apple root is an unusual wood that they use there. Um, then also, the uh, table here, uh, the dining table here, it's a Fairfield County piece. If you notice above the lakes here, there's a sunburst. Uh, the sunburst is uh, often used on Fairfield County furniture by the cabinet makers, uh, table makers, the cabinet makers have a generic term for furniture maker. Uh, they often use this uh, sunburst, it's often associated with uh, Fairfield County furniture here. A couple of other items in this dining room. Um, this is a uh, tea box here, or tea chest. How it, uh, it would store tea in these bulk apartments here on the side. Um, then they can take a small spoon, take the tea out. Um, and if you do different types of tea in here, it's often they would mix it and then put it down in the teapot to brew it. So it's a very unusual item that they would have had at home of this period and uh, this uh, kind of status. Um, one other unusual item, you can see these uh, two chests on top of the uh, side uh, buffet here. Uh, these are called, the term is called knife box. Was actually how they um, was one of these sort of silver that they would have had. Um, it just fits down in these slots uh, for storage of the lid closes to keep it from coming to And one more item I kind of point out here um, in this, you'll see uh, there's kind of a storage area here, a little kind of like a pantry area. Um, originally, when Homo built, this would have been a, sh a shallow cupboard like you saw in the front parlors, but when they built the kitchen addition on at the rear of the house, they uh, made this uh, cover a little deeper here. Uh, this uh, copper sink you see there uh, would date to the 1880s period. They did, they did not have running water in those days, but they would use it like a dry sink, set a little water down in there, clean their dishes off, and help the same house catch the water in water that was spilled over there. So it's an um, unusual item left over from that period. And then one other thing to mention this doorway you see in the corner here. Now, this one is where a dump waiter. Which is power is like a small elevator and you know, cracked the elevator. Came the original kitchen downstairs up to this floor, but they could then you know, bring the food up from the kitchen and throw the dishes back down to be clean for their life. And all right, one more room we'll go through, and we can, I think we can wrap it up. So we'll go back here. Uh, this is kind of the uh, side entrance to the home. There's a door to the exterior here, and kind of a back stairway that you'll see here. And then this leads directly into this room, uh, which is called a reception room. Uh, so one theory, uh, this probably would have been more like what we would call today like your family room. Uh, they probably would have used this more day today than the more uh, fancy parlors in the front there. And it was also believed by Kraken uh, had several businesses here in town that he would kind of conduct business from this room. Uh, they can easily, the doors can easily close. People can come in from the side entrance, conduct some business with them, and they can leave the house and go through the entire home here. But uh, most of this, all the furniture in the home that you do see is 1830s period uh, when those are packets. I uh, would have lived here. Um, so it's, the house is uh, curated to that period and a lot of these items here. There are several that um, are, have some local significance. Um, this is a uh, dulcimer, a very fancy dulcimer here. And it was made here in Lancaster, uh, probably in the mid 1800s. And one other item we have, which is very unusual, is this large uh, 
I think we call it a bass today. We actually call it the bowl fiddle. Um, and that act was used um, as, you know, I believe the hooker where the canals were came in uh, there. And there was a, uh, it would be entertainment as cowboys came in. So this was the history behind that. It was used here during the canal days. So um, it kind of wraps up the tour of the first floor here at the Georgian. So uh, the museum is open uh, Monday through Sunday, or sorry, Tuesday through Sunday from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, and we open um, beginning of April and run through mid December each year. So hopefully you can come and visit us here at a normal entrance fee. And uh, we'll appreciate your time. And hopefully you've learned something. And uh, you're welcome to seeing the Georgia at any time you'd like. So thank you very much. Okay. So, Tammy. Are you there? Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, great. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Um, and also I should, I should introduce Tammy. Tammy Drabina from uh, Fairfield Heritage Association. I should have said that when we started. Um, so does anybody have any questions for her about the Georgia Museum? I do. Um, they mentioned a fee to get to see the, the house or for the tour. Um, what is that? Yes, the admission for adults is $6 for one museum. And if you want to see both, you can get a combo ticket at $10. And we offer a discount for a AAA and also senior citizens get a discount too. Members get in free. So if I want to become a member, what do I have to do for that? Oh, we would love that. You just can get on our website and uh, there's a form to fill out and send in the, the membership fee or you can call our office at 740-654-9923. We can help you do it there, but um, membership will run for a year, a calendar year, and there's all sorts of benefits. You get a discount at the gift shop on top of the free admissions. We have a quarterly newsletter that we put out that uh, just won an award last year. Mary Lawrence, our marketing director, does a fabulous job with that. Um, you would get first chance to buy tickets for many of our events too. So, so there's there's a lot of benefits to being a member besides the fact that you are helping keep this free alive in Fairfield County. Fantastic. And then if I come, is the tour guided or do I just kind of go through? the house independently? Now we have a docent-led tours at both museums, the Georgian and the Sherman House. And this year, because of the pandemic, we started doing time tours. So they start on the hour. Uh, the Sherman House 12, 1, 2, and 3, and the Georgian is 1, 2, and 3 for tour times. And uh, we are limiting them to eight a person. And you can go online uh, at our website and sign up for a ticket and make a reservation so you know that you're going to get in. Uh, we do take walk-ins also, provided that we're not full already. That's a great question. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. How many rooms did he said was in the house? And are they, I mean, as far as uh, sleeping accommodations, are they on the second floor? And uh, some of the things that he said, I was hoping you could reiterate on it. And that was the year the home was built. And uh, I didn't fully understand why it was called the Georgian home. Okay. Uh, the home was built in 1832. Um, it was called the Georgian because in the uh, 1930s, 40s, there was a tea room here and it was called the Georgian tea room, a, a little business that was out of the home. And so, so many people knew it as the Georgian when it was renovated in the 70s, the, the name kind of stuck. So that was what they decided just to call the Georgian. It has um, 13 rooms. Um, I think there's over 6,000 square feet, not, not counting the attic. It's a very large house. The bedrooms are all upstairs. There are four bedrooms. Um, the master, a children's bedroom, and then two spare rooms for guests. Um, and did I miss anything else that you'd ask? 
No, I think that was it. Uh, while you were talking, am I right in understanding that if you had on the bottom of where the staircase was, is it a gold button or is it a silver button? That means you paid off the house. Am I right? Yeah, that's the, the legend that we've heard. If you had a silver button, then that means that your home was paid for at the time it was built. If you had a porcelain button, then that meant that you took out a loan. So we like to laugh and think that maybe the, and some of the nosy neighbors came over and ran over to the staircase to see if you had a loan or not. I'd be in big trouble. I got lots of loans. <laughs> and Pamela, I think you'd ask me if, it, if you uh, went through yourself or if they were guided. I'm not sure I answered that. They are docent led tours at both places. So um, a docent will take you around each room and explain some of the history and point out some of the interesting items. Um, so, so they're not, uh, we're not set up for people just to, to go self-guided. Okay. Do you have like, um, if somebody was visually impaired, do you have anything to support that so they could take the guided tour as well? Um, no, we do not, uh, except that the docent explained some things so they could, uh, could at least hear the story. They couldn't always see the items, but they could hear the story. We do have a DVD available in both places. So if anybody is mobility impaired and can't take the stairs, we can play a DVD for them that shows them what is on the upstairs and the lower level so they could at least um, see it. If it's not in person, but at least uh, see it on the DVD. Fantastic. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, does anyone else have anything else before I show the Sherman House? All right. Let's try to screen share again. Hi, I'm Laura Bullock, the director of the Sherman House Museum here in Lancaster, Ohio, and I'd like to welcome you to the home and the birthplace of General William Thompson Sherman. Uh, the Sherman family came here in 1811, thinking with one child uh, from North Norfolk, uh, Connecticut, and eventually had 11 children. So all the uh, other 10 children were born here in this house. Um, they, they lived here, or they owned this house until 1868, and, um, you know, were very uh, active members of the community. Um, they, um, what, they, <laughs> uh, this, this, this um, room here was not here when the Shermans first lived here. They, um, it, it was built on by the second owners in the 1870s. But the wonderful thing about this room is that all the furnishings belong to General Sherman and his wife, Ellen Ewing Sherman, uh, during their married life. The portrait over the mail is of General Sherman in uh, his complete dress uniform and just three years before he passed away in 1891. Portrait uh, on the left is of uh, Mary Elizabeth and her husband over here, William Reese, uh, General Sherman's older sister, her husband, uh, built the house right next door to decorative, what is now the Decorative Arts Center uh, for Ohio. And the portrait over here is of John Sherman, General Sherman's younger brother, the author of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And he spent about 44 years holding different political offices 
in Washington, D.C. So he was a very, very influential man during his lifetime. Now, the gold furniture here and the oval table belong, originally belonged to General Grant and his wife. Then when he became president, it was passed on to the Sherman family. The black chairs over here are part of a set of 12 that were made especially for General Sherman. And each, each chair has a different uh, Shakespearean scene on the back of it because General Sherman was passionate about the uh, theater. The bust was done by Augustus St. Golden, who was the premier sculptor during that, during that time period. Um, the, uh, the military shield over here shows General Sherman's uh, entire military career, starting from when he was at West Point, going through all, um, all the Civil War, and then ending uh, what was showing him as a four-star general. He was uh, this country's third four-star general after Grant in Washington. Now, when we walk into the next room, you're going into uh, back basically uh, 200 years in history. And this is the section of the house where the Sherman family lived. This is their uh, parlor. And uh, many of the artifacts that we have in the house uh, belong to the Shermans but everything is historically accurate and time appropriate for the period. This period would be at the time period between 1800 and 1820. One of our amazing artifacts is this needlework by General Sherman's mother, Mary Floyd Sherman, and it's silk thread on silk fabric, um, made to look like an old lithograph. Women didn't always have the same education as men in the 1800s, but they showed it through their needlework, and the needlework was exquisite. And then as we go into this room, Charles Sherman was General Sherman's father. He was an Ohio Supreme Court judge and a lawyer. He maintained an office here at home and also downtown. Uh, he rode a circuit around the state, holding uh, court in many different locations. So he was often gone for four to six weeks at a time. The tall bookcase over here is out of the 1820 courthouse here in Lancaster. And that's where Charles Sherman would have practiced law. The, the, desk, the desk chair here, also came out of the courthouse, and a little writing desk belonged to General Sherman. The print here is, is a picture of Roger Sherman, and he is um, a distant ancestor of the Shermans, the only person to have signed all of our uh, uh, original uh, national documents, the Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights, and so on. The Sherman family was not a wealthy family, but they were a prominent family and a very well-educated family. So if we walk um, through into the rest of the house, As I said earlier, the first room we came into was added on by the second owners. This was the original entrance uh, to the house. Uh, it was on the side of the house to keep some of the dirt out and keep some of the fresh air in. You'll notice all the woodwork is uh, original to the house, the, and, and as is the flooring. Lancaster is located pretty much on the center of uh, Zane's Trace, which is the first road into Ohio. And many times the uh, travelers would stay here in Lancaster. 
um, often the dignitaries would stop here to visit the shrines. This is the dining room. Uh, it was uh, when the Shermans lived here. Uh, this house was considered the center of hospitality. Um, it said that um, many times there were more people sitting around Mary Sherman's table than any of the inns here in Lancaster. And this is another example over the uh, mantle here of Mary Sherman's work. And again, it's silk thread on silk fabric. And then to move into the kitchen. The kitchen would have been the busiest room in the house. It would have been the lightest, the warmest, uh, because of the fireplace. And um, 1800s life, family life, often revolved around the fireplace. Um, all the, the, it was a very, very busy day in here. I'm sure Mary Sherman came down uh, before daybreak with a baby or two and started her uh, her day, whether it you know whether it was cooking or or uh, you know maybe she had to make soap or candles or maybe she had to uh, take care of her herbs. Uh, we also have, uh, if you can see on the window there, three historically accurate gardens. Uh, we have a kitchen garden for the herbs that she would have used in her, in her cooking. And then in that, there's a medicinal garden that Mary Sherman would have used uh, to often grow her own medicines um, to make dyes or uh, products that she used to take care of her home. And then on the far side, we have uh, a garden that represents um, native plants to Fairfield County. And those are the plants that told the early settlers that these were this was good farmland for their fields. This is the master bedroom, the bedroom that Charles and Mary would have occupied and probably with a baby or two with them all the time. Uh, the Sherman children, children were born um, between a year and a half and two years apart. This is the nursing crib uh, beside the bed and the bathroom facilities are on the far wall. The cradle here is the original Sherman cradle that the family brought with them from Connecticut. So all the Sherman babies were placed in that cradle to begin with. This is the children's bedroom. As far as we know, the only children's bedroom that they had, um, you know, while the children were young. At any point, uh, when in 1829, when Charles Sherman died, there were probably five children, maybe six, in this room. Um, it would have been a relatively cold room because it has no access to a fireplace and it also has an uh, open porch underneath. It's an example of you know how the 
children's toys, the uh, children's clothing, those kinds of things from the early 1800s. Is that, is that a bed? Another interesting thing about the Sherman family is that all the 11 children grew to be very successful adults. And very sadly, most families uh, lost children um, at, at that time period. And this room we call the family history room. It would have been a bedroom when the Shermans lived here. Um, but at, if you start, uh, when you first come in, you can see a map of Zane's Trace. And then we, as we go around the room, we're in chronological order through history. Uh, the bust is of Thomas Ewing, General Sherman's foster father, and then later in life, his father-in-law. And this is a portrait here of Maria Ewing, Thomas Ewing's uh, wife. This, this portrait shows General Sherman in 1859, when he was the first superintendent of what is now, now Louisiana State University. Uh, John Sherman here, U.S. Senator. And the marble bar relief is of Lincoln, and it originally belonged to General Sherman, was passed through the family, and then eventually here to the museum. And the last section of the house that is the Civil War section. This is a recreation of a general Civil War tent. General Sherman preferred staying in a tent during the war rather than commandeering a house. He felt that it kept him closer to the soldiers and the parts of the war. The uh, horsehair trunk in the back belonged to General Sherman, as did the footlocker here in front. The little writing desk, desk those all um, were carried through the war with him. The flag here represents the four corps that marched to the sea with General Sherman. He designed it, and that's the uh, uh, copy of the one medal that he wore throughout his life. And then as we head into the uh, war room, turn to your right and it's the Civil War uh, in chronological order as General Sherman was involved. And you can start up here with the first battle of Bull Run and then follow through to um, the Grand Review, which is the final days um, after the peace treaties were signed. Most of the artifacts in this room belong either belong to General Sherman or uh, soldiers from Fairfield County. Confederate flag high on the wall here um, it was captured by Union soldiers and brought home. Uh, you can see the pieces were cut out of it to, uh, to keep the souvenirs. The autograph pictures here uh, show the generals that marched with, Gen uh, with General Sherman. The portrait up here is uh, done by Healy, one of four portraits that he did of General Sherman. This. Um, this watercolor here uh, shows the, ge the generals of the Army of the Tennessee, and uh, generals, they're the ones who, uh, who were with Sherman toward the end of the war. This 
this is our GAR uh, exhibit, the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, they were a, a very, very influential group uh, during uh, right after the Civil War. Uh, five of our U.S. presidents, our next U.S. presidents, came from this group. They um, made possible, or they struggled to achieve um, veterans pay, uh, homes for veterans, homes for orphans. Um, they they did uh, um, made things very nice for our country. But, you know things that we hadn't had before. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions about the Sherman House? I think that video was a little bit better. Um, not so jumpy, maybe a little bit more in focus. Hopefully you guys can see everything. Bodie enjoyed it thoroughly. I think most no of your questions? questions are in, the, well, there is questions, but they're all in the chat. Okay, yeah, sorry, I just saw them. My screen came back on. Um, Oh, who were the last residents to live in the Sherman House? Um, I do not know their name. Uh, it would have been uh, like in the um, 40s or so, I think, and 50s. At some point in time, the Ohio Historical Society took over the museum because it was a home until that time. And then the Ohio Historical Society took it over as a memorial site. And then we got possession of it around the early 1980s. Uh, the Historical Society was trying, uh, had some budget problems and they were trying to you know, help themselves a little bit with some of their uh, uh, properties that maybe they had a struggle maintaining. And so they offered it to the Heritage Association. And then so we have owned and operated it since then. One of the other ones, Tammy, was, does General Sherman have an autobiography? Yes, he, he did. He called it uh, his memoirs, and uh, it did come out in around the uh, 1870s or 80s, I believe. So, yes, you, you, can, you can read those. I don't see any other ones. James, am I missing any in there? Do you see any? I don't think I... Yeah, I, I think I typed a few in there. I was, <laughs> well, the, uh, the history that she covered was fascinating uh, because one of the things that crossed my mind is uh, the year the Sherman House was built compared to the Georgian House because the Sherman House, um, uh, the space or the square footage seemed shorter than the other house. So I was to assume that the Sherman House was built years before the uh, the other house was built. Am, am I right in assuming that? Yes, it was built about 20 years earlier. It was built uh, around 1810 and they moved in in 1811. And when the camera was outside, if you notice the wooden frame part of the house, the brown part, that was the uh, original house that the Shermans owned. And then the brick part was added on later. So uh, it was uh, more modest. Um, it was still uh, closer to pioneer times, and then Mr. McCracken had made his fortune uh, with his businesses by the, the 1830s, and he was uh, more able to afford a, a palace such as he built. And I take it both families knew each other, the Shermans and the McCrackens, because I'm thinking uh, the Shermans what, had 11 children and they all became successful, if I'm correct. So I'm thinking from generation to generation, the Shermans have always owned the house uh, that, is, that they're living in. And I was surprised at the fact that they had so much historical collectibles. And the only thing I can assume is that because the generation of the Sherman children, 
they were able to hold on to those collectibles as compared to the collectibles I saw over in the Georgian house? Uh, yeah, Mrs. Sherman lived there until uh, the 1860s and then uh, she moved away, moved to live with her son in Mansfield. Uh, with all the children, the, a lot of the artifacts were just, you know, divided up and passed down through the family, and they've been very generous with us uh, to, to uh, give us things back. And also, that happened with the McCracken family. Now, they only had uh, two sons that lived to adulthood, and, uh, but their descendants have, as well have uh, been generous in returning items that belong to the original owners of the Georgian as well. So we're very fortunate to have a, a good relationship and have people who understand how important it is to preserve history working with us. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, you have to forgive me because I could probably go on and on with dozens of questions <laughs> that are connected with both homes. But I thought he said, she said that there were four presidents that visited that home. And is that right? Who were they? Um, I think she was talking about the GAR and that there were five presidents that came that were part of the uh, army, the Union Army that would have been uh, into the Grand Army of the Republic reunions, uh, which would have been. Oh, I don't know if I can recall them all. Hey, but Grant, you know, certainly was one. Um, I, I can't have off the top of my head. No, Hayes, Benjamin Harrison. Oh, McKinley, and we and we thank Garfield. Thanks for a little help from Mary here. And and James, you you need to come and visit. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, history is something that I enjoy and the connection that is made to um, because it leads to other questions about Sherman because I know he's not buried in Lancaster. He's buried in Arling Arlington, if I'm correct. No, actually, he's buried in uh, St. Louis. Oh. Yeah, his, his family lived there for a while and uh, that was where they chose to be buried. Um, Tammy, can you tell us um, the cost for this for this museum? Is it the same as the Georgian to do a tour in the hours? Yeah, it's the same price. Yeah, exactly. It's six dollars to see one museum. If you're a senior, it's um, four dollars. Uh, if you have AAA, it's five. Uh, if you're a member, it's free. And then if you decide you want to go through both, then you can get a discounted rate. Okay. Awesome. All right. If no one else has anything, I think that's a wrap. Tammy, I really appreciate, I know we had some technical difficulties with this, but I think it ended up turning out pretty good. So we appreciate your um, patience and getting that done. We appreciate you being on today. So. Well, Rachel, thank you very much. It is a wonderful opportunity and we appreciate very much. And, and I invite everybody watching to come and visit us as soon as you can. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right, guys, um, with that, I think it's